Taking care of kids, adolescents in particular, in the emergency department, requires knowledge of not only medicine, but also consent and confidentiality. And usually the latter two are a lot more complicated than the medicine. So let's talk about some big topics, consent. So every state has different laws related to consent. And I have a website on this slide, which will allow you to look more extensively at the consent laws in your state. But in general, all states allow for children to consent to treatment for sexually transmitted infections, to consent to treatment if they have a child for their own child's medical care, and for contraceptive care as well, which does have some federal protection. For things like HIV, abortion, prenatal care, consent and the need to disclose to patients really varies from state to state. And even for the first three, the age at which children are allowed to consent for these things is usually 12, but it's a little variable as well. Now, privacy is a big issue for teenagers, and usually the default is to maintain confidentiality as much as we can. And when a child is old enough to consent for something, usually confidentiality is implied, except in a few circumstances. Sometimes there is a separate disclosure law that takes precedence. So for example, if the child discloses abuse or a desire to hurt themselves or others, that's going to take precedence over their confidentiality. Sometimes there's a state mandate. So for certain issues related to HIV, while a child can consent, doctors may be allowed to, or in some cases even required, to discuss things with the parents or guardians. If there's a very high chance of a bad outcome, that may be a reason to breach privacy. And sometimes the child does want to talk about it with their parents. I tell children, as long as they don't fall into one of these categories, that I will guarantee them confidentiality. But whatever they told me might be pretty big and a lot for them to deal with. Maybe it's a new pregnancy. And if they need support, I am happy to help tell one of their family members if they would like me to. And I would say nine times out of 10, they really do want me to intervene. It's also important to let kids know and for us to know about different ways privacy can be breached. If you have a confidential note in your medical records, remember parents often can request the medical records, use that confidential note. And sometimes bills can give it away. So be intentionally vague and let the child know that that may be an issue. All right, next question. What if you get the drop off of the intoxicated to the point they're drooling, aspirating, maybe even need to be intubated teenager? What do you do? Well, just like any emergent situation, you do your medical screening exam and you provide emergency care. And it doesn't matter if anybody consents or not. That is our obligation in an emergency. And the next thing you do is you try to contact the parents and you get consent for any non-emergent treatment. Can you tell the parents that the child is there for drunkenness? Absolutely. This is not a breach of confidentiality. You have a child who was brought in because they are incapacitated and unconscious. And even HIPAA allows in this situation for you to disclose information to the family. That is a very different situation than the teenager who demonstrates the maturity to come in and say to you in confidence, you know what, I'm drinking too much and I need help. The first is medical care. That person hasn't disclosed anything to you. The second, confidentiality does come into play. So let's talk a little bit about mental health and substance abuse. Again, this is variable state to state. I'm gonna use California as a model because that's my state. In California, children 12 and up can consent to mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment. However, the parents in general, except for very mitigating circumstances, do need to be informed that the child is getting the mental health treatment. And for substance abuse treatment, if it is a federally funded program, you do not need to tell the parents. But if the parents may be the payee for a substance abuse treatment program, they do need to be informed. Now, let's switch this up a little bit. Sometimes it's not the teenager who's drunk, or maybe it is, but it's also the parents that are drunk or intoxicated in some other way. What do you do 
if you have a drunk parent who's gotten into a car accident and they want to take their child home, can you let them? Absolutely not. A parent who is intoxicated or does not have capacity for any reason cannot refuse medical care for their child. There are limitations to what parents can do. And regardless of intoxication, they cannot make a decision that's not in the best interest of their child, and they cannot use religion to put their child or their community in a dangerous situation. So if there's an emergency situation, let's say a child is in hemorrhagic shock and the parents do not believe in blood transfusions, that's an emergency and you need to just give the child a blood transfusion. You need to look out for the best interest of that child. The parent has made a decision religiously. The child at this point has not because they are still a child. Alternatively, if it's not an emergency, you can talk to the family. If that doesn't work, contact social services, and you may need to take custody of that child for a little while to make the right decisions for them. All right, the sex worker. Now that's really actually not a thing when you're a child. If you are 18, you can choose to engage in pornography stripping as a career. That can be a choice. However, if you are under the age of 18, that is not a thing. One is not allowed, whether it's coercion or not in their mind, to engage a child in anything sexual in return for money, goods, housing, anything like that. It is absolutely illegal and it is either sexual abuse or sex trafficking. So let's talk about sex trafficking for a minute because that is a tough one. It would be great if these kids came into the ED with a chief complaint, I'm being sex trafficked, please help me. But that's not what happens. These are the kids that we see repeatedly in the emergency department for gynecologic infections, for injuries, maybe for vague headaches, chest pain, abdominal pain. And they're not necessarily the kids that you think are going to be sex trafficking victims. They are much younger than you might expect. Boys are typically recruited between ages 11 and 13 years, girls between 12 and 14 years. They are often children with a history of sexual abuse themselves, and they may be from a disenfranchised socioeconomic group of people. So maybe someone who is LGBTQ, not accepted by their family, perhaps somebody is who is homeless. How do we pick these up? There are some buzzwords to listen to. If you hear the word trick, the game, the life at any point in that room, that is really concerning. Look for a kid who has disproportionately expensive stuff, maybe a phone, maybe shoes. Perhaps they're with an unrelated adult for no reason. This isn't the soccer coach that brings in the kid with a sprained ankle after practice. I had a patient once who told me that the middle-aged man she was with was her Uber driver and insisted that he stay with her through the entirety of her physical exam, including the pelvic for her vaginal discharge. That's a little bit more than I've gotten out of any of my Uber rides. That's a big red flag. Tattoos are also something to look at. These children really aren't tattooed, they're branded. They're branded by their traffickers who want other traffickers to stay away from their property. And so you will see tattoos in visual, visible places like the neck and the hands. They often have something to do with money. Alternatively, it may be a crown as an homage to the trafficker who likes to think of himself as the king. Get the patient alone if you can and just ask some very direct questions. Has anyone ever asked you to take your clothes off? Has anybody ever offered you food or housing or money to have sex with them or to film something sexual? If the patient is 18 or over and they do not want to report any of this, give them resources, but there's no mandatory reporting. If the child is under 18 and you're fairly certain that this is a sex trafficking issue, this does require a report to social services and possibly the police as well. There is a National Human Trafficking Resource Center. They have a hotline that you can give to patients who don't want to report right now, adult patients, and they can help you in terms of recognition and help for these victims. And if they'll allow you to, do some testing and prophylaxis for pregnancy and other sexually transmitted infections. All right, so we have a 14-year-old girl, vaginal discharge, cervical motion tenderness. She is having consensual sex with her 19-year-old boyfriend and wants this to be confidential. Well, she has cervical motion tenderness, so we're thinking this is PID. 
we're going to send a vaginal or cervical swab or a first void urine for a nucleic acid amplification test. We're going to ask her if she needs rectal or oral testing as well. Give her a dose of ceftriaxone, a prescription for doxy and metronidazole, and a 48 to 72 hour follow up. And even if the tests are negative, we're going to continue with the treatment because a lot of PID is not from gonorrhea or chlamydia, but from other flora. We can screen for trichomonas and other STIs as well. And we want to treat the boyfriend. Ideally, he's willing to present for testing and care, but if not, Expedited partner therapy is completely allowable in 46 states in DC and potentially allowable in the others. So it's suboptimal, but write a prescription for him for one gram of azithromycin and 800 milligrams of, cef of cefixine. And remember, they cannot have under unprotected sex until they have both finished their treatment for seven days. Now the boyfriend's 19 and she's 14. Don't you wish you didn't know that? So do you have to report the boyfriend? Well, every state is a little bit different, but many states have what are called Romeo and Juliet laws after Romeo and Juliet of Shakespearean fame who were 16 and 13. And these laws typically allow children within a three or four year range, as long as they are 12 and above, to have sexual contact with each other. This is the one for California. And if you look at the age of our patient, she's 14. You look at the age of the partner, he's 19. And in this case, yes means it's reportable and no means it's not. We have a no, so this is not reportable. Do you tell the parents? Well, again, this is for California. She's seeking treatment for a sexually transmitted infection. She's over 12 years of age. The answer is no. She has capacity. She can consent. It is confidential. You make a sensitive note. You get her phone number to call the results to, not the family phone number, and Dispo or home. Thank you.